All right, live and direct. Welcome to the Bro Diallo book review. I know it's been a hot minute, so I ain't going to delay any longer. Let's just get into it. This book review, and uh, yeah, I'm not even going to make a commitment to be more consistent. I, I can show you better than I can tell you. So I apologize for the delay of the book review. I'm very happy that you're uh, tuned into the book review still. And uh, go back and check out uh, my entire series, Culture Bandits Review of Dale Jones, uh, Amos Wilson. I was going to do an Amos Wilson series, but again, we got kind of derailed, but we back. We back on track. And this is a book that I've wanted to review and revisit for quite some time. And it's going to be painful for me to review this book because upon my rereading of it, it didn't stand up as I'd expected. And there's a lot of things that I projected onto this work that just weren't really there and a lot of things that i've suppressed in my mind about this work that you know i can't really ignore anymore but let me just say that i still have a great level of respect for the author and appreciation for his impact of his many works this being one of his many classic works but this book really helped me to navigate uh young adulthood uh, coming out of high school, going into to, to college, first years, uh, living away from home, living out of my city full time. So it, this book really aided me quite a bit. And um, I was enthusiastic about recommending the book to my sons and and uh, revisiting the concepts in this book very often. I think it is very creatively written as well as academically sound in certain areas and other areas it, it kind of goes off the rails and i have to be honest and even when i spoke to uh my wife dr mingo about reviewing this book she was like well you know you've always been very fond of uh dr akbar so you know keep it together so anyway so let's get in with both feet i guess it, the book didn't really need that much of a disclaimer but i just had to tell y'all what i'm thinking i'm a little rusty at the review so bear with me but today's on bro diallo book review or whatever day you're watching this um the book we're reviewing is the community of self revised i didn't really read the revised edition i'm not sure that i can remember it but my current copy is a revised edition that I revisited and reread. There's a wonderful picture of young Dr. Akbar, handsome fellow. Um, so, but the book, as I said, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the Community of Self Revised by uh, the esteemed Dr. Naeem Akbar, published by uh, Mind uh, Productions and Associates, and the revised edition was released in 1992. I'm the class of 92, so that's cool. And uh, we're just gonna jump in with both feet, right? The book is a, a very dense, very short, but very dense in content. And I'm going to go over some of the major concepts and overview. And then maybe we can have a Q&A or some type of book discussion about it. And who knows? Inshallah. <laughs> I mean, let me hold it together. You know, if, if, if things line up, maybe I can even reach out to, to the esteemed Dr. Naeem Akbar and have a discussion on the air with him about um, this classic work, if he even remembers. He's one of those scholars that could be like, honestly say, I didn't forget, I didn't already forgot most of the stuff you've yet to learn because he's been around and been engaged in struggle and enlightening and awakening our people for a long time. So anyway, the book starts off with the motors of self or the book pretty much defines an individual as a community. And there are certain residents in your community, in your psyche, in your mind. So that's what the community of self uh, does. And Dr. Naeem Akbar very, very keenly dissects and identifies the various community centers. So you as one person, you as one person it is occupied by certain drives, the motors of self. He calls them motors, no need to change. But he also talks about... Um, aspects of the communities, the roles they're supposed to play in a healthy person. And when those various members of your internal community, when they get out of pocket, when they're not properly positioned within the community, they're not properly fed, housed and clothed, how a person can be basically imbalanced or dysfunctional or what I like to say maladaptive. So let's start off with the motors of self. Number one, he talks about the drives or the instincts. He states that people are born with drives. Drives are not taught, you know, which 
again, I might have issues with that because there are, but again, let's just get through the work and maybe we can suss that out later. But drives, according to Dr. Umar, are not taught. They're inbred, they're inborn. I guess they're biologically hardwired. And he said there's are two types of drives, drives toward pleasure and satisfaction and drives away from dissatisfaction. Um, give me a moment. I hate to be um, these glasses. Are... Yeah, I'm new to the glasses community. I'm relatively new to wearing glasses. I haven't been wearing glasses for six months, but I went to the goddamn eye doctor and the hating ass eye doctor prescribed me some glasses with his hating ass up until that moment and you know my auntie said don't go to the doctor they always find something i should have listened to her and i wouldn't be sitting here with 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 smudged up i wouldn't be bespoke anyway i was i was too cool for this but that's what they just does but you know here we go he states that there that that drives or he also called instincts are inborn they can't be taught that there are two types of drives what drives us towards or that humans have we are driven towards pleasure and satisfaction and we're driven away from pain and dissatisfaction he said that drives attack attract us to what sustains us physically they move us away from things that may physically harm us that again you know me being a brother who loves my chocolates who loves my goddamn cookies you know, I'm attracted to many things that physically harm me and many things that physically can potentially harm you, give you pleasure. But, you know, I understand what he's saying in a broader sense, but in a day to day detailed sense doesn't really hold up. But I do believe that he kind of is giving like in a perfect world type scenarios here. I'd like to quote him on what he states about the drives, because, again, drives are taught. There's something we have to accept about ourselves and everyone we interact with. And that we know and recognize that in general, the two types of drives is the drive towards pleasure and satisfaction and the drive away from pain and dissatisfaction. And Dr. Umar, quoting from the text, states that if the drives are permitted to rule the self, the person becomes only a physical pleasure seeker, an Epicurean or so to speak. So the instincts, the drives, are not appropriate to rule the community but they are present and component of ourselves and they can be beneficial in keeping us away from harm and helping us to maintain things that are good for us going on away from these are the motors of self remember uh the senses seeing hearing smell touch that come from the central nervous system they are also present at birth. Now, we also know that some people are born with lacking senses or can lose certain senses. And we're all aware that when certain senses become compromised or we lose them, other senses we lean on more and they come, become more enhanced. We're pr pretty pr familiar with that. But basically, the recognized uh, biological senses, seeing, hearing, smell, taste, and touch, those are also present at birth. And we can also quote the text. And he's saying the senses are to the community of self what communication is to communities of people. So they just are conduits of information. Right? But senses only give incomplete information. You ever deal with people that are like, just go by the stats. You know, black men commit the most crimes. Therefore, black men are the biggest criminals. That's, now, you if you go strictly off of crime stats, you'll understand nothing about justice. You'll understand nothing about who are the true criminals who perpetuates, motivates, sustains, and profits from crime. Not to say that the stats aren't relevant, but he is so true. And way back in the 90s, I'm so glad that Dr. Umar articulated this basic set to me that I was acting able to extrapolate going into the medical field, going into political science and public policies, going into my formal education, you know, understanding that data facts are incomplete and we'll get more into what, you know, the true role is. But remember, as Dr. Umar says, the, your senses are to your internal community what communication is to your larger community. And they only give incomplete information. 
And he states on each of these good things, not inherently bad. But if a person is ruled by their senses, they are often deceived and only operate off of surface information and sensation. I.e. they are reactionary. Going on to the ego or what Dr. Akbar calls the emotional ego. The ego speaks up for the rights of the individual. Ego makes sure a person isn't being violated. Emotions are tools of the ego. The voice of the ego. Again, we'll quote Dr. Umar. He said, when gripped by emotion, reason, reason fails to function adequately. He states that people ruled by ego become tyrannical, self-centered. They are ruled by emotions, easily excited, easily offended. And we all know, I mean, I, everybody right now, as you listen to me, are thinking of people who are governed or ruled by their ego. So in the first four motors, we find that our drives and instincts are should not be the, at the forefront dictating how we navigate the world. Neither should our physical senses, sensation, but nor should our ego. Which is would be rather surprising that, in, and especially this was written prior to the social media era where narcissism and egos are celebrated, so to speak. And even if you say, I don't celebrate narcissism and egos, look at who gets the most engagement. You know, go look up songs like Bow Down Bitches and, and how the people we celebrate. But I digress. Then there is memory, which is the archive or the library of the community. When memory dominates the community, your internal community, people live in the past, causing a person to repeat old patterns of living over and over. We all know somebody stuck in the past, reliving that peaked in high school. But uh, let's keep going. Now this one kind of gets me in trouble. You also have reason. Reason brings order and organization to the information brought in by the senses. When reason dominates the community, you can be cold and unfeeling. It judges the world on the basis of category and characteristics only. Now I have great love and great value of reason. I think reason is not only underrated, it is suppressed. But I also agree with the good doctor that it should not dominate our internal community. And number six, conscious, or what he called the self-accusing spirit. Now, these are one of the, what I would have, for lack of a better term, one of the red flags of this text. Because I'm just be honest with you. There's way too much Islamic propaganda in this book for me to be comfortable recommending it. I would have to understand that the person that I recommend this text to is well versed on Islam it, the theology and Islam the documented history and Islam's impact on African people past present and the trajectory of the Islamic faith and the Islamic elites going forward with that saying I'm not going to get too caught up on there but this this whole self-accusing spirit is is and if you read it in the text it's heavily derived from Islamic theology and Islamic belief system. But moving on, the conscious. And the conscious polices all components of the self. It is your internal police force. <laughs> and some of y'all be like, F the police. You can fuck the police um, in the outside world, but some of y'all need to black the blue. <laughs> some of y'all need to black the blue because some of y'all operating without conscious. You know, and when conscious rules the community, but if you're dominated by your constant, it leads to a constant state of dissatisfaction within the self community. Self hate, self rejection, lack of confidence, and 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 the confident and a and a, and a dominated conscious will suppress and dominate the ego. It will tear down your senses. So that's not even though I love reason. I love consciousness, but not from a theocratical point of view, but from a rational point of view. I do agree. A constant condemnation of every thought 
every weakness, every drive and rising up from the lower self. You see some an attractive person walk by you and you be like, mm, and your conscience like, oh, I'm a lustful scumbag. If I decide to get up a Saturday and I'm like, I'm just going to spaz out and watch some TV or play some Xbox. And then, you know, by that afternoon, I'm like, ah, I'm unworthy. I'm a scumbag. I waste too much time. So conscious is a valued member of the community, but it is unworthy to govern the community. And number seven is the will. The will is set to organize and harmonize all components of the self community. By education, and he says by education and purification. I don't support the context and connotation of purification. Again, I think that is more of a natural, na uh, supernatural or theocratic. If I was writing this book, which I ain't qualified, I don't pretend to be smarter than Dr. Akbar. But in this one part, I would not say by education and purification. I would say by education and refinement. But he states by education and purification of the will, which gives freedom from negative influences from the parts of the self. The will, which is the divine representative. This is a direct quote, which I which kind of th again throws me the will, which is the divine representative within the person when working with their higher parts of consciousness and guided by proper direction is the intended Khalifa. And again, like I said, when I read this as a teenager, you know, I was just coming out of, I was long out of Christianity, to be honest. And I had looked into, um, I was secular, I was an atheist, but I was very receptive and still well within the trenches of my theocratic indoctrination. So when he talks about the will, I agree when he says that the will is an organizational component and that the will should govern the self. Your will should govern yourself. The fact that he roots the will in the in 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 the Khalifa. That he roots the will and he associates purification of the will. By supernatural forces is a problem with me if i was writing this i would call the will the intellect the intellect should govern all of the drives your intellect should utilize and and synthesize the consciousness your 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 reason your memory your ego and your senses and your drives and instincts but again, this is where where the book kind of when I was revisiting, like, wow, you know, a lot of Islamicism in here that I don't that I would even that that's very curious to me. But again, what do we say? You know, we don't say we vegan over here, so we don't eat the meat and throw out the bones. <laughs> we can consume the fruit and toss the stem. But. He doesn't leave you hanging. He doesn't give you this wonderful diagnosis, this this wonderful breakdown, this this really good way of understanding who you are and and the components to your self and leave me, leave you hanging. He gives us insights in the second section of the book and how to develop responsibility for self. And these are the steps to harmonizing your community and cultivating yourself so that you can get the most out of your various drives and motors. Number one, he says, lower the volume. You must determine that the volume of some popular music is simply too loud. You must decide that the images parade portrayed in visual media are too destructive so that you must eliminate them from your experience. Now, again, I understand this but I don't fully agree with 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 uh, this level of censorship. I think that um, if you engage or you use this technique, I it's better to me to understand how to 
process such exposures. I do agree with turning down the volume in terms of not just the physical volume, but the, the, the power and impact of those things. But eliminating them is, number one, not really necessary. And number two, for many people, it's not even possible. And I think that that when we start to what I call cloister ourselves away from the, the, the masses of the people, it, it kind of makes you susceptible to cultish or egocentric behavior. But that's what he suggests, that we try to eliminate Sex and Red and Sukiyana. They were probably weren't even born when this book was written, but in that day, the negative music. And I have, as one who at that time was was very aware of the negative impacts of the media i would engage it listen to it dissect it study it because you can't really revolutionize educate engage with the people unless you know what the hell they're doing he does uh go on to state in the text that you can of course take the parasites uh way and simply follow those around who have gained control over their lives and try to imitate whatever you see them do. So he says, if you see people who live the life that you wish to live, if you see people conducting themselves in a way that you want to emulate, and if you follow those around who have gained control over their lives and imitate whatever they do, he calls you a parasite. Now, I don't agree with that. I mean, whatever happened to mentorship and role models? So, but he says, lower the volume. And I simply says, don't allow the popular media, the common media and what's going on around you to 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 have free access to you. You should regulate it. And sometimes you can crank the volume all the way up and, and twerk <laughs> and listen to ratchet music or you can lower it. And, and when it's time to read, study, reflect, or time to conduct the business of the people, you know, you can turn that volume down or turn it off. And I think his text kind of contradicts that because it itself, because it is, it acknowledges that we have drives that are instinctual, that are locked in for pleasure. But then he says, shut it off. Which means become less than human from my point of view. Number two, he says, listening to your inner voice, sit quietly in a room, drive without the radio, take advantage of early morning hours as an opportunity to simply listen to ourselves. Now, I wholeheartedly agree with this with no pushback in, in, the, in the work to cultivate, refine and develop yourself. I do this all the time. You know, I look forward. Sometimes I travel on my own. Sometimes, you know, everyone's out, you know, my, my, my children are out or my wife has her obligations and stuff. When I get time for myself, I greatly value and living in a busy home and having the, the network and the community that we have where we're in contact with people. Um, sometimes, you know, when I do get that time to be alone and quiet, I don't devalue that time. And that is precious time. And I kind of like a social butterfly i like people i'm very extroverted and like engaging with people you know even when they don't like me as much but i wholeheartedly agree with that take advantage of and then i think that is something that is out there that me time thing I, i'm with that um accepting freedom now i'm going to quote him again where he he kind of pushed me where he kind of lost me uh dr Akbar states, the creator has given us authority over our lives and over much of creation. Only a few are human enough to exercise that authority. I think that's utter bullshit. There's no evidence of a creator. There is no evidence in the physical structure of the world, in the atmosphere, the geography of the world, that we are to exercise creation. Most of the water on this planet we can't drink and most of the environments in this planet we cannot exist in without great technological inputs. So I think that's nonsense and I think that it's extremely unhealthy. Muslims, Christians and other theocrats or believers 
keep pushing this whole nonsense. And one other thing. One other thing. It is not the humane people who exercise authority. It is the inhumane people who have the most authority in this world. This line threw me again. This is something when I reread the text, I was like, God damn. Right. But going on, he states that growth is a natural process and stagnation is unnatural. Another thing I somewhat have problem with this whole thing about nature and the deification of nature. And the natural fallacy. Because we find stagnation in nature. And we find growth. But what we really find nature. Really seeks out. If left to its own devices. Is homeostasis or balance. So that means sometimes you got to be growing and achieving. And sometimes you got to sit the blood clot down. Sometimes you need to be advancing. And sometimes you need to be retreating. And sometimes you just stand still. And I think this kind of contradicts when he talks about lowering the volume and listening to the inner voice and then talks and advocates for growth, you know? So I have a lot of issues. Another thing he states in the book is self-control, improves self-control, the exercise of the will, uh, increases the strength of the will. The exercise of freedom makes us free. Now I do agree with that. I do agree with that. Um, a lot of times when, when, you know, when my wife and I, we, we will commit to working out, we'll commit to, to, to walks and exercise. The more we do it, it just becomes second nature. And if we fall off, if we, a lot of times when we, we have to do a lot of traveling or something else comes up and we, we fall off the, our, our fitness regime, it's hard for us to get back on. And when it goes from exerting effort for something we were doing effortlessly. So I do believe that you should practice self-control and the more self-control you exercise, the more self-control, the easier it doesn't even become like self-control. It's just your natural uh, uh, going about and the will and exercising the will strengthens the will. Iron sharpens iron and the will is like a muscle. The more you work it, the stronger and more effortless the effort becomes. Then he goes on to say, we must seek out people who foster our growth rather than dragging us deeper into the fad of influence. I agree with that. But again, when I read it in context of the larger book where he's calling one minute, if you look up for a person who uh, will foster your growth, you can be called a parasite. <laughs> you know, and I do also think we should seek out people who we can chill with. I know I got people that push me. My wife pushes me. You know. But she also is somebody I could chill. Have some organic biodynamic red wine and binge watch a show with. So um, I think, again, you should. There's some people in the same person that will drive you and push you. I have friends, homies that are extremely competitive. And I have homies that are chill people. And I think, again, as he stated, balance of all these different aspects as opposed to leaning to one to the other. So on the surface, where he says seek out people who foster growth is a good thing, but his concept of growth is somewhat problematic to me. And rather than people who drag us down into the fad of influences, I really don't know what the fad of influences are. You know, I have a homie who grinds, who works hard, who owns his business. And sometimes he comes around me and I know he's stressed and he's grinder. And I'm like, let's just go play Mortal Kombat. Let me beat the shit out of you in Mortal Kombat and chill. And relax. You know, and I have homies like, listen, all that black stuff and revolution stuff. I know you on that. I appreciate that. But let's go get some coffee and crack some jokes. So if you are and, and this whole concept is online, this predates that only be around. Are we getting money? I ain't going to be around you if I can't get money with you. That unto itself is imbalanced and toxic. But I digress. He goes on to talk about African-American freedom. The group problem is no more than the individual problem multiplied as the individual problem is the group problem reduced. We need to work on resolving both the individual and the group problem at the same time i wholly agree with that i don't believe in the oh i got to get my life together you know 
You got to help myself before I can help the next person. It is a simultaneous event. As you cultivate yourself, you should be lifting up and cultivating those around you and making a positive contribution to the larger liberation struggle. Dr. Art Bar states, we have not regained our freedom because we have not learned to listen to the inner voices of ourselves. <sighs> we still only listen to ideas, interpretations, explanations, and directions that are given to us from the outside of our communities. Now, this is teetering on victim blaming. We have not regained our freedom because the forces that seek to oppress and subjugate us have waged relentless attacks against us, our leaders, our people, our culture. It ain't got shit to do with listening to inner voices. But let me let me calm down. But I don't really agree with that statement. I could say that it can be problems that do arise, but the inner voice is not defined. So this ill-defined things and I think we should listen to ideas, interpretations, and explanations and directions are very valuable. And we should use our reasoning, our intellect, or what did he call our will to discern what are the good interpretations. But like I said, this teeters on victim blaming. And there's another quote from the book. And I, I'm again, I the reason I have to go hard on this text is because I love this book. I recommended this book. So I have to be honest with myself and the people that I've recommended, including both of my sons, about this book. Where he gets into the ethereal, talking about the inner voice is the compassion for each other, a commitment to the, the creator, a respect for nature's laws and the spirit that has refused to be defeated. The inner voice is self-love and an appreciation for a beauty and a being that goes back to the very origin of human time. That's extremely ethereal. What does it mean to have a commitment to the creator? My parents, the prehistoric primates that we evolved from, the single cell organisms. The inner, the thermodynamics and the energetic forces, the atmosphere. I don't know what he means by creator. I do know what he means. He means Allah. What are nature's laws? Again, are we talking about physics and thermodynamics? Gravity? I mean, I respect those things, but I, he doesn't specify The inner voice of self is self-love and, and appreciation. I, to me, it's a bit ethereal. And because he, his distinctions, I'm not sure why this is in here or what it's supposed to mean. But I, I figured it's a quote, again, to say, you know, where I kind of mix things up. But let's move on where he talks about the power of self-knowledge. When you start to recognize and properly attune the community of self then you have start to, and 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 the benefits what can we derive from that well he talks about what power is he states we tend to see power as magical we begin to attribute power to illusionary process such as skin color speech patterns dress and similar superficialities without power it is difficult to know that power is merely a byproduct of knowing who you are and using who you are to me again a bit ethereal a bit ethereal from a scientific point of view power is the ability to do work it is related to energetic forces whereas in a political scope power i would lean on dr huey p newton is the ability to define reality and have it act in a desired manner I do not agree that skin color, speech patterns, and dress are illusionary processes, but they can be superficiality. So this statement is half 
from my point of view and my conclusion is half accurate and again he he kind of undermines it with with, with kind of getting into the realm of ethereal rhetoric and then he states that in a section the loss of self-knowledge is slavery again i don't agree with that <laughs> you can know who you are know your ancestors dating back to the prehistoric or times of antiquity and you can still be enslaved but he stated after generations our resistance to slavery was greatly demised because we had no self definition outside of being slaves I don't think the historical record bears that. But going on, because he fails to give the time when resistance was diminished. At what time? Where at what time was resistance at its greatest versus diminished? Whether he wasn't talking about colonialism, uh, uh, the U.S. chattel slavery, the slave trade of the Caribbean. And as far as I know. Resistance was continuing and a constant threat. Even if you look at the position and the how the enslavers allocated resources and structured the slave system, they were under constant threat. And there were Africans who had little memory of Africa, of the roots, where they came from, who managed to enact widespread rebellion. anti-colonial uprisings but anyway and what's also funny is that our oppressors have suppressed mm -hmm. not a year goes by where i don't find out about some grand uprising some level of resistance some some anti-colonial anti-slavery hero that i never had heard of and i consume all the history of our resistance to the atrocities of slavery and, and, and colonialism. I consume as much, but not a year goes by that I don't learn about a new uprising. So I don't know what he's talking about. And he doesn't give specifics. He doesn't say in this era, during these decades, in these regions, resistance was at this level and, and, and it diminished over this time. And this is what the Africans knew at the time of heightened resistance. And this is what they understood. He just makes the statement. He just throws it out there. You know, our oppressors constantly had to adjust their, their tactics to maintain their oppression. Or as Dell Jones calls it, and I love repeating, they would often have to loosen up and get, for a tighter grip. If it all it took was, hey, you don't know your ancestral language or your ancestral nation or tribe or your lineage. Therefore, your resistance is diminished. All you had to know is this motherfucker raped my loved one. This motherfucker kidnapped my child. This person did this bad thing to me, regardless of what I know about a decade ago or generations ago. You, that's all you need to know. This dude is harming me and things i care about so i i but let's keep going dr R. akbar states once we were robbed of knowledge self-knowledge then slavery as an institution was no longer necessary because we had become mental slaves i don't like this rhetoric about mental slaves i don't like this rhetoric uh that slavery was ended because we lost knowledge of self there's just too much to unpack there i disagree with that statement i disagree that even if you don't have this vaunted self-knowledge many revolts and rebellions were carried out by illiterate people who couldn't find africa on a map but they understood if i punch you in your face you understood that you were punched in your face. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you have of your ancestry. And I think we lose a lot of people when we try to bring them to the revolution and we we, we put all this baggage on them. When they say, hey, this is an injustice. In fact, when it comes to injustice, children learn that before anything else. If you've raised children, if you've had toddlers, when they learn to speak, after they learn to say mama and dada, the next thing they learn to say is that's not fair. Fairness 
And, and he talks about things that are instinctual. That are born justice, instinctive love of justice. Fairness is something that is across cultures that doesn't have to be taught. They have experiment experiments with everything from monkeys to dogs, where one dog gets a treat for doing a service and the other dog doesn't. And the dog that doesn't get the treat is like, I'm done fetching, I'm done sitting. You giving him. Now you can go look up and maybe um, in, in the editing, I could put it on the stream. Uh, uh, monkeys were taught to do task and one monkey got a grape for doing a task and another monkey got a peanut and the monkey that was getting the peanut was like i'm getting a lesser reward for same work i've done and the monkey went on strike and i'm sure the dog and the monkey don't know its lineage and its knowledge of self so i think that that knowledge of self can aid us in constructing resistance it is a component of reasserting our humanity but this whole until you have knowledge and all this other stuff is not a prerequisite. I believe that the historical record doesn't uh, bear that out. But moving forward, uh, Dr. Ar uh, Akbar states in the post-slavery conspiracy, he states that uh, section of the book that the outcomes of self-knowledge, when you have knowledge of self, which he loosely defines... He loosely defines as uh, self-knowledge, uh, knowing your history, knowing your ancestry and all this stuff. He says once you have self-knowledge, you have self-acceptance, self-help, self-discovery and self-preservation are the outcomes of self-knowledge. I can't argue that that's not true. But. I wish he would, would, would academically describe self-knowledge without the, the, the uh, supernatural components. And now let's talk about self and society section of the text. Like I said, it's a short book, but it's very dense. Right? He talks about attitude, an inner state which affects our choices. He talks about... Uh, the negative attitude, he talks about a positive attitude, and he talks about information. Now, again, yeah, if you if you follow my conclusions and analysis, I don't really think about negative and positive attitude. I think about the accurate attitude. It disturbs me, the people who are in a constant state of positivity. To me, that is a delusions of grandeur. So if I engage with someone with a negative attitude, I'm not going to condemn them for having a negative attitude. I'm interested in understanding what is the source and what is the resolve. Why are you in a negative state and how do you intend to process and get through that negative state? So if somebody says I'm being mistreated and I intend to alert others to this mistreatment to distance myself to mistreatment to 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 confront those who are mistreating me and make these specific demands and level these specific consequences i'm like yeah stay negative that's appropriate he already told us that the ego is our defense mechanism and that the emotions we use our ego utilizes the emotion to direct our so a negative attitude and nobody's in a constant state. It is an ebb and flow. He states that, which is pretty accurate, that attitude is shaped by primarily by information. Information must be accurate and honest. It must be, but it often isn't. And we must accurately evaluate our information. So you have faulty attitudes based on misinformation, but that could be positive or negative. You could be walking around smiling, thinking it's all good while you being set up for a downfall. You know, or you could be negative and pissed off when everything, everybody around you is trying to work to your best interest. So your attitude doesn't necessarily have to be negative or positive. Your attitude needs to be accurate based on the information that is available to you and the appropriate processing of information. 
And then he goes on to talk about the self-concept, which is the way we see ourselves. Dr. Akbar states that in part, we must rely on others to reflect to us how they experience us. Which is very good, which is a statement to condemn individualism. Individualism is pathological and it harms the individual. So when you look at other people, not just in terms of how you impact them, but what they can inform you about how you're impacting yourself, how you're engaging and structured yourself. So very well stated. Dr. Umar, he goes into respect where he states society must respect the person. Society is a force expressed through culture, tradition and education that impacts directly on the individual. Society should stimulate the people in a productive and satisfying way. Respect activate, activates the self-concept in a positive light. Respect, like information, must be accurately and truthfully based. Agree with all of that. I wish he had done a little more to define what respect is beyond just what respect should do to give and get. Let's talk about principles. He speaks on principles where he states principles are those standards of conduct and evaluations which identify the aspirations of the person. That's why I state and I quote um, Kwame Ture, we can't compromise our principles. We can compromise strategy, tactics, methods, but principles have to be fixed because once you change principles, everything else changes. Whereas you're if you sustain principles, if you change things around the principles, you can still maintain trajectory. He states that principles are the guidelines, the blueprint for our humanity. I so agree. I would say principles and ideology, but principle. Um, he finally on the on that section on, on principles, he states we should evaluate our principles carefully and be certain that they are ours. Amen. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So, so you see how this book, it's easier to read a book that's all bullshit. And this again, this is my assessment, a book that is all the way off. Then read one that has so much valuable insights, but sometimes comes with a haymaker on. It. Let's move on to his assessments of protection. The diet for the mind. Dr. Umbar states that if we fill our minds with too much of the materials and experience provided by this culture, Western capitalist culture, we run the danger of mental discomfort in the form of depression or mental confusion. Yes, this is what is called a pathogenic society and a pathogenic culture. If you do nothing but abide by the laws, standards, ambitions, goals, values of this system, you are by default a sick individual. It's not enough to be a good American, a good law-abiding citizen. I so agree with him on this. He all goes on to state that we find in the presentations of a diet of mentally destructive material, which was taken excessively, will leave us very uncertain about what we should and should not do. Again, so true. And this is in 92. This is when the very era where the gangster rap overtook conscious hip hop. Where the KRS ones, poor rights teachers, public enemies were displaced and overridden by the NWA, the ghetto boys. Bust down. So, um, again, let's just keep. I mean, there's so many gems in 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 uh, this part of uh, protection diet for the mind. He stated at certain points it is important to refrain from feeding the mind. Silent. Silence and concentration are essential for a healthy mind. Again, I agree. He revisits that. But at one point he says, get rid of it all. Or he suggests that we should completely censor it. At other times he says, you have to regulate it. I think regulation is better. Or, or, or I could even say inoculation from this kind of shit is better than living in a bubble from it. He states that mental growth 
is obtained by walking in a natural environment, growing plants, talking about your feelings to a trusted person. You know, how to maintain and sustain yourself. Notice when he talks about self-care, he doesn't talk about traveling to some exotic location, spending thousands of dollars, going out for all these economic, everything he puts in the true self-care category is something that could be done without the expenditures of resources, money. It's things that could be done for free. It requires an expenditure of time and a connection with others. That's self-care. This whole individualized, monetized self-care is capitalist bullshit. But then he goes on to say, and I'm all, he gives, lifts me up like, yeah, let's go, Dr. Akbar. Word, I'm with you. Then he moves on to say stuff like, the highest form of mental growth is divine wisdom. See what I mean? See what I mean? How he, how he play? Play around. He, yeah, he gets me. In both ways. He gets me in terms of he understands and he's really enlightening me and he gets me by he sneaks up on me and punches me in the face intellectually <laughs> now, i don't like that and he talks about the duly proportioned man which he means mankind or men and women or i think he would say if he was writing this outside of 92 the duly proportioned person and he states which i think contradicts some other things that he states but i agree with him a wide-ranging diet gives the best outcomes. A little bit of this, a little, a little of that, a little, a little of this. Some intellect, some slackness, some principles and fun, some hard work and some good rest gives the best outcome. And then he goes on to state that violent tendencies are fed by violent words. Quote, the more violence we expose ourselves to the more violent we become the more evil we observe the more evil we become we should carefully select the kinds of experiences and people to which we expose ourselves i agree with this but i don't think and the science does not support mortal combat or watching the godfather or tournament not taller so those i think real material violence coming from our culture versus the fantasy violence and games i don't think they have the same impact but on whole i agree with this um argument especially when we understand homelessness is violence we understand poverty malnutrition and starvation is violence we understand that expropriating the labor of others hoarding wealth while others are in abject poverty, those forms of violence. But I don't agree with simply, which he doesn't state, but some of y'all sometimes takes away from, I'm not going to expose myself. I don't want, don't bring me no bad news. The Wiz. I can't believe y'all let the Wiz have a renaissance. That's the most colorist, colorist anti-black movie ever. That's another discussion. But I guess, let it stand on that. I don't really think that the more violence we expose ourselves, the more violent we become. So I don't really agree with that, but I understand what he's getting there. I have been exposed to an enormous amount of violence in real life, flesh and blood from, from, from the childhood of, of being a child of addicts and living in the projects during the height of gang wars and the crack epidemic to being a, a radiographer in level one trauma centers to working in prison infirmaries across the nation. I've never, it, and it's made me resent and reject violence. I've never been exposed to violence that made me want to be a violent person. Same thing with evil. I don't really agree. I understand that the negative impacts of, of, of negative stimulation on the mind and the self and the trauma that that in, ensues. But not everybody says, oh, I'm exposed to violent trauma. Therefore, I'm going to be become violent. I just don't think that's an accurate assessment. But we should curate our diets. We should curate our experiences. And not just for the pleasure, but also for development, solidarity, and things of that nature. But going on. He talks about unnatural mentality, which is the root of mental problems. Uh, the Christian 
and crucifix narrative that in order to be good, you must suffer. He rejects that the people have grown to equate suffering with the necessary price of sin. He seems to reject that. Uh, many marriages are battlefields because the husband believes that the wife must suffer in order to show her love. He states, he said, mothers and fathers abuse their children because of strong religious controls on their thinking, which um, teaches only unhappiness and suffering and that suffering builds character. People wear suffering as a badge of honor, as a destructive influence on a peace of mind in the present world. Hustling and grinding. People go online and say, I haven't slept in five days. I work 18 jobs. I'm, I'm in school. I do for self. I don't ask nobody for nothing. And then people give them all these accolades. I'm like, oh my goodness. We shouldn't encourage that. He goes on to talk about the love for misery has been planted by unnatural religious imagery such as suffering Jesus. I totally agree with that. And, it, and, and see how he goes hard in the paint when it comes to religion and he's absolutely accurate but has a blind spot when Islamic indoctrination enters the fold. So you got Islamic contaminations in your analysis but you're Christian free. And I wish he would give that same brilliant critical eye to the mm -hmm. negative impacts and the unnatural mentality coming out of Christianity. I wish he turned that critical eye on Islam. And the rest of y'all on spirituality, on Ifa, on all of that critical eye needs to be shed upon all things, even the shit we like. And then he states... And I, I, this is another one where he hit it out the park. Revolutionaries have a strong martyr complex. And people think that you aren't real revolutionary if you aren't in a perpetual state of suffering and lack. Amen. I've had people attack me, say I ain't a real revolutionary because I have houseplants. <laughs> and go find those videos where I'm debating somebody on some topic and they be like, you talking all this shit, look at your houseplants. You ain't real with it. But I digress. He also talks about decaying families. Dr. Akbar pushes Judeo-Christian nu nuclear family rhetoric. You have to go to the book to read it yourself. As opposed to communi communal, multi-generational, village-centric construction of the family. So even though he acknowledges the, the, the harms that are leveled against African families, his solution is the nuclear Western Judeo-Christian family. And he goes straight from calling out this Christian narratives, this Christian Western oriented culture and mentality and how it harms us to saying, hey, we need to structure our families with a, a husband, wife, 2.5 children, a picket fence and a dog. You know. And then he talks about the education of the African child. And again, I have to tell you, Dr. Akbar has been very influential on the community itself, breaking the chains of psychological uh, slavery, visions for black men. I've read them all more than once. So again, I have to say, like Dell Jones would say, this is criticism with affection. So everything I say that I have issue with and don't let it fool you into thinking that I do not have respect for Dr. Umar and his positive contributions to our just aspirations. But let's keep going. Education of the African-American child. Dr. Umar states that education should equip people to satisfy and provide for their needs. We must begin a philosophy which cultivates African-American thinking for African-American survival, self-thinking for survival of self. Such a philosophy would have to define us in terms of our needs and on the basis of our identity. That's gospel. We celebrate black folks solving everybody fucking problem. Y'all looking at... uh. Hidden figures like that's a good triumphant story. Every, every year around graduation, y'all post some some black geniuses with 7.5 GPA. A straight A student graduates high school with, 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 with half a dozen or to a dozen college credits and going on to Harvard and Yale. And nobody ever asked, what is this child's ideology? Some child says, I'm going to go work for NASA. I'm going to go work for and you're a Pentagon agent. Black excellence, black people doing capitalism, 
Black people achieving goals set by other people. Black excellence shouldn't is never defined as working for or on behalf of African people and, and being in opposition and subversion of our enemies. When a black athlete wins Wimbledon or gets the trophy and the uh, a gold medal for USA in the Olympics and y'all calling that black excellence while leaving African athletes and African teams in the dust because African teams or HBCUs even can't get access to the best of black talent. But I digress. All I'm saying is right on, Dr. Akbar. I love when we agree with each other. I don't like bumping heads with, with, with our elders. He states the ideology of educating the African-American child. And again, he states African-American. I know a lot of y'all got problems with this, but again, we know who and what he's talking about. He said our children must be equipped to avoid propagandizing influence, which direct them to self-destructive behaviors. The content of education for the African-American child. He goes on to state educational content, the content. Educational content should always focus on and draw from the form and process of the natural world. Reading, science, and arithmetic should draw from natural occurrences at the root. I agree with this, but it needs to go beyond that. I don't think that we, this, this whole reverence of nature thing is, 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 is a, a logical fallacy, but I understand where he's coming from. There should be a foundation upon which we build. But if you remain at the foundation, Again, you're not helping yourself or anyone else, which he doesn't suggest that. I just want to put it out there. He talks about the scope of education for the African-American child because of the minority status of the African-American child in the American environment. It is important that he. That's what the book says. It is important that he sees himself from the perspective of a worldwide majority early in his education. Geography is a must, especially in conjunction with the with his appreciation of the value of land. There's a lot to unpack here, but we're getting a little over time. Let me just say this. From an, I don't know why he says he, but we know Islam and education of girls, how that's that's a fucking fucked up arena but you know let's keep it moving but i totally agree our african children need a world african perspective they need to see themselves as members of the african diaspora not simply as cit minority citizens of, of america i agree with him on that um he offers method of educating the african-american child he states that an educational process which involves excessive passivity on the part of the student results in an over-reliance on outside sources for the acquisition of knowledge rather than the confidence and the child's ability to discover for himself. Islam saturates this thing, which I agree. And this is what we did in with our children's education, with varying degrees of success, I agree with that. But if you have a daughter, go ahead and insert herself or themselves. But going on, he states that children should always be approached reasonably. Yes, children are thinking people. They can be reasoned with. They should be viewed as developing minds with adequate reasoning potential. Therefore, one should approach unacceptable behaviors as well as acceptable behaviors with reasonable explanation as to why, which means the Lord is going to be mad at you. Sin, evil, that is unreasonable. But I totally agree with that. I ain't even going to say nothing more on it. And he kind of ends with that pretty abruptly. And in his conclusion, which is just one paragraph, you know. He talks about education, cultivation of the community of self. I still appreciate this book, even though there are areas that I find problematic. I, um, I find it hard. I struggle with reading just about everything this man has put out and listened to dozens of his video and audio lectures. I find it hard how he could be so brilliant in certain areas and remain with his blind spot to Islam. Hopefully I'll get to ask him that question. But beyond that, I do recommend this read, but I do recommend it with a asterisk saying caution Islamic rhetoric present 
And then let me start rating these books, Black Fist ratings. I would give this book out of five Black Fist, I would give it four Black Fist. It would be five if not for the, the few contradictions. And even the charts, I mean, I love charts. Even with the charts, and I got to go, I really appreciate y'all checking this out. Like he gives the community itself the will to govern, or what I would call the intellect, all the other aspects of the self. Um, we will have a Q&A and a discussion once this is done, and we'll even invite Dr. Akbar to join us if his schedule allows. Thank you for yet another Bro Diallo book review. They will be coming at you. Support, like, share, subscribe, make, make a contribution from Cash App, become a Patreon, do all that so we can keep pumping out this at, um, content. I'm not even going to tell you what the book next book is because I got like four books on deck and I don't know which one I'm going to do, but that's it. Good night and I'll see y'all next time with the Bro Diallo book review. Again, thank you to Dr. Naeem Akbar and the community of Self Revised. Peace.